Our speaker today is Dennis McBride, PhD. He's academic uh, president of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. His talk for today is entitled Darwin at 200, Human Nature at a Few Million, and a Myth to Spell. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dennis McBride. As in every story, there's a victim. And there's a victim in the story that you're going to hear today. And that victim happens to be poor people, people who cannot afford to hire a law firm. I, I will enrich that claim, I hope, in a few minutes. You're going to hear three tracks, three trajectories today. The first are some important issues associated with Charles Darwin, his life, and his life as a scientist that turned out to be odd, but very important for what we know today. Secondly, I'm going to talk about his second book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. I'm only going to talk about volume one, which is The Descent of Man. And then thirdly, I'm going to review for you a perfect storm, a collision of three trajectories themselves, which have produced a gigantic myth that we enforce today as law. We'll dispel that myth today. Okay. <clears throat> um, first, some characteristics of Charles Darwin that not everyone knows, but they, it, it turns out they're very important. First of all, most know <clears throat> he studied medicine, um, but he wasn't very happy with, with medicine. In fact, uh, I think it was the first surgery that he observed. Um, and this was before Crawford Long, the good Georgia Bulldog, had, had uh, come uh, forward with ether. So he watched a lot of pain and suffering and decided medicine was not his, not his future. He studied uh, theology. That turned out to be very, very important, as we're going to see in just a little bit. Um, but in his heart, in, in, in his heart of hearts, he was a naturalist. As a boy, he was very busy collecting things and organizing them and trying to understand relationships between and among things and groups of things. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it turns out when he got the opportunity to sail aboard Beagle as the naturalist, his father said, absolutely not, no. Fortunately for us, both his father and uh, Charles Darwin had lots of respect for his uncle. So they consulted the uncle who said, this is the best idea I've ever heard. So Charles' father relented and Charles Darwin was on his way on December 27, 1831 from uh, England. He, he embarked under the command of uh, Captain Fitzroy, who was 27 years old, but a brilliant sailor and brilliant navigator. Uh, Charles Darwin, only four years his senior, and they were underway. Um, <clears throat> it turns out, in another irony, that little did Captain Fitzroy know that he was bringing a, what would be a world preeminent scientist around the world to collect evidence to inform a theory which he, Fitzroy, would later reject and reject publicly and vehemently. Little did he know. Um, prior to embarkation, Darwin had been given a book written by Lyell entitled Principles of Geology. And he was told by his very good friend, John Stephen Henslow, don't read this book, and if you do read it, don't believe it. Well, being the skeptic that he was, Charles Dar Darwin devoured the book, and it made a huge difference in the way he would come to perceive the many observations that uh, he was about to encounter. For example, right off the bat, as the ship um, made contact with South America, uh, Darwin observed three bird species whose wings had been adapted for something other than flying. Uh, one group, one species used their wings to paddle, another for fins, and the third uh, actually for sails. Uh, he was yet to encounter flightless cormorants in the Galapagos Islands. Um, but the Galapagos uh, uh, were next. Now it turns out that Charles Darwin was very prone to seasickness. And that was a real, real good thing. By the way, motion sickness and provocative motion sickness is extremely important to this day as an applied medical problem within the services because there's lots of provocative motion and a lot of, a lot of lost time because of it. And we still don't quite understand how to deal with um, the, motion, the motion sickness, although we can medicate against it. Um, <clears throat> well, the reason it's important that Darwin was seasick is that that gave him the opportunity and the motivation to portage whenever possible. So he would depart the ship and he would walk ashore and the ship would, would sail. And, and th what happened was, as he would go up elevations and down elevations, 
he would notice, wow, you know, this species up here looks a lot like one I encountered way down there at the shore, but it's a little different. It's smaller, it's bigger, or it's a different beak. And so he was applying the principles he learned from Lyell's geology and forming his own theory uh, of geology, which preceded uh, his publication of the uh, theory of, um, of evolution through natural selection. <coughs> Galapagos Islands. This is one of at least two strong suggestions I'm going to make for you. You have to do the study tour of the Galapagos Islands. It's amazing. Uh, I went by myself um, and I went daily on the excursions with the tour guides who are very, very well trained naturalists. And um, for me as a biological scientist, I have to say that I, I get it. I see why Darwin probably made the breakthrough thinking in the Galapagos Islands because you had islands that were separate and distinct and you could see them except for those over the horizon obviously. But most importantly the number of species was tractable and, and because of that the human mind can do the factor analysis and say I've made this a tractable problem I now see the difference in this finch family and that finch family, and they're only one island away. How did that happen? Uh, so it's a remarkable trip. I encourage all of you to go to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, unfortunately, Darwin um, picked up what we think was Chagas disease while he was in South America and, and close by. And this is a, a protozoan that uh, boards an insect, and then a mammal is bitten, and you've got the disease. Uh, it's a chronic um, fatigue. Um, it, there can be an effect on the heart, which probably contributes to the fatigue, but Charles Darwin suffered this for the rest of his life, um, and he, he tried to treat it medically, but of course we were where we were in, in the early 1800s, mid-1800s. So five years after setting sail, Darwin returns to Falmouth and immediately takes off to his hometown of Shrewsbury. Uh, and this is very interesting in, in his life because uh, he ended up uh, proposing marriage to um, his uh, soon-to-be wife, Emma Wedgwood. Emma Wedgwood, little-known fact, studied piano under Chopin. Amazing family, the Wedgwoods. Um, and as important as every day was for Charles Darwin to us, the most important day to him was the 11th of November in 1838. He called it the Day of Days. That's the day he proposed marriage to Emma. And he so loved that woman. I think it's so appropriate on Valentine's Day that, that we smile about his love for her and, and, and her, her tolerance for him, um, actually. 